through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 265. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of Monsters University, we're going to be talking Pixar. Oh, yeah. I mean, we could talk about all of their films yes. for hours and hours and hours. Yes. But we're going to try and cut it down a little bit. We're not going to talk about sequels. Yes. We've already talked about Cars and Brave before, so we're not going to talk about those. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to hit on a lot of the more yes. known, noteworthy the ones. The majors, yes, exactly. as you want to call yeah. it. So if you want to complain about that, hit us up. We yeah. understand. But, you know, I'm sure you could say as much about it as we could. Yes. Let's I mean, just, what... Has there been a more prolific uh, animation studio since I mean, Disney? We could spend an Disney. hour talking about just Toy Story series. <laughs> yeah, like, so yeah. let's let's try and uh, yes. keep it real. Speaking of Toy Story. Yes, let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the film that brought Pixar to prominence was yes. Toy Story. The first fully generated, uh, first CGI. fully computer generated full length yes. feature film. Uh, I mean, the story of what occurs with toys when humans aren't around. Essentially, mm -hmm. they have their own lives. Yes, they're their alive own, when people aren't around. But they have their own lives, their own interactions, mm -hmm. they have their own world. It's a very kind of beautiful idea. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. sure like every child sort of imagines that growing up. What better to be an animation studio to start out with such a, such a, and tapping into such a old thought of just what if your toys were alive? Like how many things have yeah. been about toy soldiers or, or small soldiers is pretty much about toys becoming alive. Indian cupboard toys becoming alive. I mean, it's an old idea. I mean, it's a very interesting idea. I mean, obviously they have classic sort of characters like you have the cowboy, mm -hmm. and you have the the spaceman, spaceman yep. sort of obviously setting up this conflict between the new and the old, which mm -hmm. is the crux of the movie as the new toy is sort of displacing exactly. the old toy. They even originally wanted Paul Newman and Jim Car Carrey to be the two voices to represent old and new cinema. That that would be very profound in some ways, but I'm glad they stuck with Tim Allen. Oh, totally. Tom the people they so end up good. going with. It's one, of those, it's one of those things that's like, you know, you could talk other casting for Toy Story all day, but it's never going to be as good as the cast that ended up being the final cast. I mean, obviously, you got to give a lot of credit to John Laster. Mm -hmm. He was one of the founders of Pixar, and I think you know, and a lot, I mean, a lot of people have spoken this. This is the the sort of template that has been set since then in terms of Pixar and how much they time they spend on quality, yes. how much time they spend on ref, like. Um, Tweaking yeah, stories uh -huh. and f refining everything to Making get it sure just right. Making sure everything is just right rather yeah. than just pushing it out fast. But, I mean, you, obviously that's part a John last, but you also got to give a lot of credit to Steve Jobs. Because at this point, Steve Jobs yep. owned Pixar, mm -hmm. and he so firmly believed in quality yes. that he was willing to let them spend that extra time. Where a lot of studios, you know, you think about you know DreamWorks and mm -hmm. all these other ones, you can see, especially during their early years, that the product feels much more rushed. Yes, in terms and as of, they got successful, it was more money is pushing it in the later yes. than it is that they want to make quality. Like, also, Let's make another Ice Age. I mean, these films cost tons and tons of money because yes. they take like you know, especially back in the day, they took four or five years. Or whatever yeah. to create. So I think it took it's, something like a uh, seventy-two hours or something to render each frame yeah. in the original Toy Story. Yeah. <laughs> so it was it was a huge time yeah. commitment to make sure everything was right. And I mean, it's I mean probably still to this day the most iconic um, mm -hmm. story at Pixar. Even though they've done so many great ones, I think most people would immediately think of Toy Story if you yeah. asked them to think of a Pixar. And, and as, as we talk, they continue to break ground as more and more come out of them. But this one still set that, in some way, but this one really set that mold. I mean, this is the first animated film in Oscar history to be nominated for a Best Screenplay Academy Award. Yeah, and it received a special achievement mm -hmm. award at the Oscars because of what it had done. I mean, yep. ever since then, obviously, they've gone on to create its own uh, animated yeah, because how do you compete? How do you put like Toy Story versus uh, what it came out ninety five? So that would have been what? Yeah, ninety. That would have been what like Pulp Fiction? Like how do you? Uh, that would be the year before that. Oh, that's I don't right. know, like seven or something. Yeah, like how do you put like major yeah. live action Hollywood movies against? And there's a whole. It's a whole different caliber, and you know, it had never been that, with the exception of Beauty and the Beast, it had not ever garnished, animated movies had not ever really but garnished that level of... It makes oomph. sense, though, that, you know, we get that kind of respect, because when I give you these kind of names, like, obviously, you know, John Lasser was involved mm -hmm. with the story. Uh, Pete Docter, who's a person you'll come to yes. know a lot, 
because of his work at Pixar. Andrew Stanton, oh, yeah. again, another one there. But also, uh, Joss Whedon. Yeah. He worked on it. Like, yeah. Uh, Wrote one of the versions of the screenplay, so, right? I mean, he's one of the writers. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they had like seven writers on it, which is normally a huge red flag. But yeah. these are all people who are so immensely talented. Joss that, Whedon specifically created Rex the Dinosaur. That is an entirely created by yeah. him. Uh, yeah. Interestingly enough, this is the only Pixar film to have full opening credits. Interesting. I mean, that's probably just buying into the whole Hollywood tradition at that point. And it's also probably the fact that this made such a name for them that after this, they didn't need to have opening credits. They could just... <laughs> yeah, I mean, this one definitely was more um, heavy in the star power mm -hmm. than as they go on. They become much better about, you know... The story and the, the story, world yeah. encapsulating. I mean, and this was like, hey, we have all these celebs, and like we got Randy Newman doing, you got a friend in me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, opening credits, it's a computer animated movie, but it's a real movie. Come on, guys. So, yeah, I mean, they definitely have stars going forward, but it's it, it, they've been much more open to sort of finding the right voice for yes, the right role. Yes, definitely. On, which is cool. Though, I will say, one of the most underappreciated projects that they did mm -hmm. was Monsters, Inc. Which is Obviously. appropriate, considering we're talking about the sequel this week coming out. Yes. All right. That, technically, the prequel. Yes. That's, sorry. 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 Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> yes. Monsters, Inc. tells a story about, you know, a world full of monsters mm -hmm. and how they have to generate power, essentially, by scaring yes. children. And it's a job. Rather than scaring yes. because it's their nature, they scare because what they do for a living. Yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> it, I mean, it's then... Uh, a huge dilemma when a child follows them back mm -hmm. into the world of monsters and sort of cuts through that illusion. Especially and, since they're all afraid of kids. Yes, they feel like they'll get <laughs> infected. I think yeah, they I think, yeah. carry diseases or mm -hmm. something like that. And it's funny because, you know, I think, I mean, people enjoyed this film, mm -hmm. but it n was nowhere near the sort of like cult hit, not cult hit, smash hit. That Which Toy is Story funny was. because when it came out it was, it, it, it broke records in the sense of being the most, you know, highest grossing like animated fil to film to date and it like broke all these home, own yes. home ownership records for so many people buying it. But again, I think maybe it's because people were so already ready for Toy Story 2 to come out or the next Pixar yeah. project. This was the sophomore slump kind of idea. It was, it was great, but for some people, it wasn't Toy Story, so it oh, totally. didn't get the same Which level is, of credibility. I mean, credibility. if you actually think about it, this was, um, this was directed by Pete Doctor okay. when he sort of came in, and Lee Unkrich, who then on on to do like Toy Story 3 and okay. stuff in it himself. But, you know, it, it, it won... Um, Best original song for If You Didn't Have It by Randy Newman, which is funny because Toy Story <laughs> did. Yeah. But it was also only nominated for best animated feature it didn't win huh. let me look up quickly i forget what won off the top of my head but it's sort of it's sort of amazing to think of pixar not winning that because yeah. they become so synonymous with best animated feature mm -hmm. i mean they won it almost every year yeah. that they've been eligible for it just about yeah and um it's it's kind of amazing to think that there was a, an age at which pixar was not the best or most popular. Exactly. And I think that's Shrek. What, Shrek one. Ah, okay. And see that's what I think this was. This was the okay, Pixar broke the mold by saying that you can make a computer animated movie that can be almost best picture worthy. And but then now you follow it up with something. Now other people are joining it in cuz now you have Shre Shrek by Dreamworks is coming in and you got other people competing. You know, do you continue to rise up or do you have a little bit of a dip? And I don't think it was a dip, but I think people's expectations for it were another Toy Story. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting to think about, you know, the original Shrek in comparison to Monsters, Inc. I think Monsters, Inc. is probably, or is definitely, a more original concept. Oh, yeah. I mean, Shrek is essentially fractured fairy tales, yeah. the movie. Yeah, and I think that Monsters, Inc. has probably stood the test of time a lot better than Shrek. Yes. Even though Shrek has had a crap ton of useless sequels. I, I wonder if there's an element of just how much money Shrek made that influenced how it did Probably in terms a lot. of winning this award. I mean, it's Shrek 1 is okay. Yeah. But, like, I, I mean, I think Monsters, Inc. definitely holds up better, as you said. Yeah. And it definitely More has, heart. It's more heart. Um, there's more um, done in terms of the work and animation. You think mm -hmm. of that, was it? Uh, was it Sully's, Sully's hair, hair yeah. etc. Oh, yeah. Where they really had to break a lot of ground in terms of creating these effects to yeah. make it more believable. And that continues to happen with Pixar. They continue to push the envelope of finding the next thing that's so hard to animate and making it a major feature of their film and, yeah. and just riding it out because they need to do, they want to continue to break that mold. And that's yeah. really, uh, I think, honorable. I also think it's fascinating that 
considering the success of Toy Story, Billy Crystal was all, at one point offered the role of Buzz Lightyear. Interesting. And he tur- he turned it down. Uh, and they offered him a future role in a Pixar film that would tailor to his talents. And he told them to do what's best for your movie and don't forget me when something good comes around. So then... That's cool. It comes around to this. Boom. See, I, this again, you know, not necessarily the most obvious casting. Billy Crystal and mm-hmm. John Goodman. Yeah. Like, both are popular people, but not necessarily, like, the most famous people you could possibly exactly. think. I mean, Tom Hanks. Yeah, this I isn't mean, Mike Myers and Cameron Johnny Diaz Depp and Eddie Murphy. Exactly, This yeah. is trying to be, like... This is Tim Allen. Or this Steve Buscemi in an important yeah, role. Exactly. I mean, they definitely... And I think that really came to pass, though, very much in the next film that they did, mm-hmm. which was in, what, a year later. Yeah, um, which is amazing. Two years think. later, sorry. I think Toy Story 2 came out between That's, these Yeah, two. I think you're right. But, you know, they were a popular production company. They really started to hit it. You know, Toy Story 2 really sort of put them Calm. on the upswing. But I think the point at which I really felt like they became... A juggernaut yeah. of filmmaking was 2003 with Finding Nemo. Yeah, that really nailed that final nail home. If there was any worry about how Shrek 2 was crappy, uh, you know, with DreamWorks, that Pixar did not have that problem, it was Finding Nemo. Finding Nemo was really that, oh yeah, we, we're we not kidding. We're going to do this consistently forever. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the story of a clownfish that goes on a search mm-hmm. for his... Son. I mean, yes. I guess technically. I mean, don't clownfishes have like both genders or something? Yeah, they're, like they're, uh, they are, I forget the specific term that is, they, they, they change sexes or yeah, something. Yeah, when, when the, the most dominant male clownfish, when the female, if the female dies, becomes the female. Yeah, so technically, so. Albert Brooks is the mom yeah. in the movie. So it's, it's a little <laughs> scientifically. It's a little scientifically <laughs> accurate. But you know, it's, it's a very sweet story. And very much this typifies that sort of idea of casting the right role. Mm-hmm. I mean, Albert Brooks at this point was nowhere near Albert Brooks in the 80s. No. Or Ellen DeGeneres was nowhere near Ellen DeGeneres no. of today. Yeah, I mean, this was the first role ever specifically written for Ellen DeGeneres. And Albert Brooks pretty much had only done, as far as voice acting worked, Simpsons roles. That's yeah. all he had really done up to this point. But it, this movie surpassed The Lion King to become the highest grossing animated film at the time it came out. And The Lion Pro- King producer Don Hahn called Andrew Stanton to congratulate him and said, it's about time. Yes. Andrew Stanton, who had previously been a writer on things like Toy Story, yes. which we had mentioned before, went on to direct this one. Mm-hmm. And he's gone on to direct others that have yes. been since huge, mm-hmm. and including uh, John Carter, yep. which... Which was unfortunately a misstep in yeah. terms of financial success, but a lot of people seem to have enjoyed like this. this guy. I thought it was uh, I thought it was underappreciated. Yeah. I'll agree with yeah. that. But you know, a lot of these Pixar directors have gotten so noteworthy because of their work at Pixar mm-hmm. that they've gotten opportunities to go on and direct live other action f- roles yeah, and so. big other franchise roles, as we'll talk about. Yes, which we'll talk about. But you know, I mean. It's hard to think about like the most tender Pixar story. I mean, you could argue probably any one of their films, sure. but I would think most people would definitely put Finding Nemo close it, to yeah. the top of that. I mean, I think one we'll talk about later is probably the most heartfelt, but I would say that the Finding Nemo I would is argue definitely that, yeah. def- Finding Nemo's got to be there. There's something, you know, there's the familial father son who doesn't who can't pull into like a parent trying to find their lost child. Yeah, I mean, it's it's And the such vastness a of the ocean is like, everybody knows how scary and creepy that is. <laughs> and it's funny to think about, you know, other animated films that were coming out during this time in comparison, like Shark Tale, mm-hmm. which was, I mean, not, I'm not going to say Shark Tale was a bad movie or anything. But it wasn't a great but movie. But Pixar <laughs> has typified their work by being um, full of heart, as we yes. said. That is one of the things that they've really been able to channel. And additionally, they've been really great at creating films that work on multiple levels. Mm-hmm. Like, adults can enjoy mm-hmm. them as much the as The classic kids. Looney Tune paradigm of yeah. you make the silly bunny that gets hit, you know, hit people with mallets, but you also have the weird, obscure operatic references that only adults which, will get. Like, which also, you know, you know, yeah, exactly. There's the very baseline stuff of, like, crazy fish is mm-hmm. swimming, you know? Oh, oh funny got... turtle! Ha, exactly, ha, yeah. Like... But, like, there is this level of heart that you really don't appreciate until you grow up and you sort of are like, wow, that's just a really tender, sweet story. And again, breaking that mold for visual effects, uh, when this, when uh, Andrew Stanton was originally approached with the idea of this, he was like, you had me at fish, because the idea of going underwater. And Pixar, uh, just they wanted to see how realistic they could make water effects look, so the art team were asked to make exact copies of actual underwater and above water shots. Mm. Ultimately, the results were deemed too realistic for a cartoon. So they actually made special effects too good 
and had to scale them back because people couldn't tell. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I definitely think that's one of those sort of paradoxes that Pixar has had to deal with as they've gone forward is that, you know, they could probably make stuff as photorealistic as yep. they want, but they don't, that's not what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. They're trying to achieve, you know, a sweetness of their creations yes. that kids can enjoy. I mean, I think if you did this, like, actual like l realistic effects people would be like terrified of like yeah, a shark trying exactly. to eat a fish or even more what happens is that they said they they after they developed this look of water they had to make it look more fake so people wouldn't think that they were just taking real footage and splicing it in because it looks so good that people were like oh you just took actual film yeah. and just cut it and they're like no actually that's all CGI yeah. no it's not no. Uh, best animated feature winner though of course of course it's deservedly true. so yeah. Moving right along, though, we're just going to jump one year forward mm -hmm. and talk another one of the most popular ones, probably, of their catalog, mm -hmm. and that is The Incredibles. Love this movie. This is the Pixar spin on the superhero genre. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is interesting because, realistically, they probably had to be working on this since the early 2000s. Yeah. I mean, at this point. To some I mean, extent. Yeah, like definitely. Probably three years or so mm -hmm. that this was in the work. And you think about when comic books sort of came back into vogue. Yep. Was early 2000s, you know, X-Men, like 2001 <laughs> I was so. playing an online video game called City of Heroes about playing superheroes when yeah. this came out. I remember being like, oh my god, they're making a movie about the game yeah, I play. Yeah, so like, I mean, <laughs> right right as like X-Men and Spider-Man were getting popular, mm -hmm. probably right around the same time they were starting this. So it was very much... Talk about how it pulse on the Well, yeah, un uncertain territory mm -hmm. at that point. That's they didn't true. know that this would be a sure thing. And again, you know, really casting a unique, unique oh, group of people in terms of voices. You have like Craig T. Mm -hmm. Nelson, Holly Hunter, Jason Lee. I mean, yeah. really, really. Samuel L. Jackson. Yes. I mean, really not the people you would necessarily think Exactly. Obvious. You wouldn't think Samuel Jackson in the kids' movie. Well, well not even awesome. just that. Craig T. Nelson? Yeah. Like, how many things do you know of him like since Coach? Probably a couple, maybe. Pol yeah, it's like Poltergeist, then Coach, then this. That's yeah. pretty much that's that's the, that's the list. Yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, Craig T. Nelson. He's been around, like Family <laughs> Stone or something. I forget. But like, very much an un yes. unpredictable. Choice. And this movie again, breaking a lot of firsts for Pixar. They they like to change it up. They didn't like just go back to the sequel for the purpose of making a sequel. So this is the first. Pixar film that has a full nuclear family of a mm. mother, father, and kids. Mm. This is the first Disney slash Pixar film to receive a PG rating. Hmm. Uh, this is the first Pixar film not to receive an Oscar nomination for its music. Wow. First one ever. And it's, as of 2012, it's the only Pixar movie to win an Academy Award for a category other than Best Animated Picture. It got best sound editing. The interesting thing also, though, is that there is, I believe, only one credited writer really? on this one, which is, I believe, Brad Bird. I'll check yep. quickly here. And again, Brad Bird. Yep, he's the only credited writer on it. And Brad Bird, yes, as we were saying before. And, hearkening back to Monsters, Inc., during Monsters, Inc., Jennifer Tilly, who was a, a voice actor in, in yes. Monsters, Inc., uh, was married to Sam Simon, who was one of the creators of The Simpsons. Yeah. Uh, she raved to the Pixar crew during the time of Monsters, Inc., so again, talking about how long this has been in production, that she read a script by a, written by a Simpsons director for an animated film. The director? Brad Bird. I that mean, far back. Uh, we, the script was The Incredibles. Have, yeah, we have to talk about two things, though, in terms of Brad Bird. Uh, number one, Iron Giant. Yeah. Like, fantastic yes. animated film he did prior to yes. getting to Pixar, which, I mean... You could argue it's probably one of the best animated films ever, yeah. Pixar or not. Like, it's yeah. just that good. It's so wonderful. It's, uh, it always surprises me that it's not like a Disney or Pixar movie already. And I'm like, really? Like, who let this script yeah. go? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's great. But then, obviously, we talk about going to live action. He since went on to direct Ghost Protocol, The mm -hmm. Mission Impossible 4, which, which was, great. was a huge smash mm -hmm. in all sort of categories. Mm -hmm. So this is like a guy who has the world at his fingertips, animated and live action. Yep. So he can pretty much do what he wants. I think he's doing, was it Tomorrowland? Yeah. Yeah, with now, uh, Damon Lindelof as well. As a writer, yeah. yeah. So, uh, very curious, very interesting career. Another Disney going project, forward. yeah. I mean, obviously, people have been clamoring as much as any sequel for The Incredibles. Incredibles is probably the sequel that I've heard the most demand and of. And I, I feel like The Incredibles is a lot like Monsters, Inc., where I feel like... At the time, it was very successful, but then people either forget about it or they just don't think about it in their head as a staple a lot of times when they think back on Pixar movies. I feel like this one gets kind of forgotten a lot of times. Like, people are like, oh, Finding Nemo, and other ones we'll talk about, and Toy Story, and, you know. You know, really, I think, I think 
as many as much as any like i feel i hear people talk about incredibles i i know Maybe a we lot just, of we people. obviously hang out with different i people, guess so <laughs> but like very very popular film people really love this i think you know um no capes come on man no capes yeah <laughs> <laughs> but like you know i think i think funny nemo and the incredibles are arguably the most memorable time outside of Toy Story mm. in terms of Pixar's um, history. I, I mean, there, there's a few coming up later that yeah. I personally love amongst my favorites that they've done, but Agreed. I don't th feel like they are as highly regarded I as can these. See that. So I can see that. Things sort of, I don't want to say started to change. I mean, you did things like Cars, which mm -hmm. was kind of a, a bummer, but one of the more sort of... Maybe adventurous decisions? Yes. Was to do Ratatouille. Yes. The story of a rat... Mm -hmm. who uh, loves to cook. Mm -hmm. a very uh, yes. foodie rat, <laughs> yes. so to speak. And Which Anthony Bourdain absolutely loves this movie and talks about how they got every aspect of being a foodie right from the critic level to the creation yes. level. And very much sort of the, the friendship of him and the chef, who's mm -hmm. sort of like a young chef in a Parisian kitchen, yeah, yeah, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Takes place in France, whatever, yeah. yeah. And again, you know, very much taking on, um, you know, uh, Interesting cast, you know, mm -hmm. Pat Oswalt as the uh, Remy, um, I think. Chosen for his rant on Black Angus Steakhouse. Really? Uh, that alone was what inspired them to cast him for the role of Remy. Interestingly <laughs> enough, this was the point I remember um, starting to really pay attention to trailers online. Mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. they released, like, the first three minutes or four hmm. minutes or something, some portion of the movie. Okay online and like HD or something. Okay. I remember spending like hours downloading it from the Apple trailer <laughs> site to watch and just being mesmerized by the beauty of the film oh, in terms of the That's quality. the thing, you want to have your mind blown. I think Sully from Monsters, Inc. had like 11 million different hairs. Remy had like 115 million. Like literally an, a whole extra digit of hair that they animated to this character. And hair is like one of the hardest things to do in yeah. CGI. Uh, once again, um, Brad Bird mm -hmm. was a director and writer this time. I believe there are a few other people involved with it. Uh, yeah, there's like five other people involved, but Brad Bird, once again, the mm -hmm. solo director on this one. And it's just, it's such an interesting, tender story, once yeah. again. I mean, the story of a rat and a, 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 a chef. A, yeah, a crappy chef who, who loves food. Be teamed together to sort of um, foil this nefarious plot mm -hmm. by this chef to sort of take over this classic kitchen yep. that is like this renowned i guess franchise in, yeah probably in, or it's a renowned kitchen within france yes. Paris, and he wants to turn it into this sort of like chef boy rd that's right yeah uh, kind of franchise bland, generic, yeah. yeah and it turns out you know he's the son of mm -hmm. the great chef <laughs> yeah it's, it's really interesting sort of i don't know almost shakespearean kind of concept yeah, i can see that this is one of those ones again like I, I think because so many other Pixar movies break so many crazy molds, it's easy sometimes to forget the ones that are still break molds, but maybe just don't break every mold. Because mm -hmm. this, you know, in France, this film broke the record for the highest debut of an animated film. No surprise there. No surprise. But it debuted at number one in the in the U.S. charts with 47 million, which was the lowest figure for a Pixar movie since A Bug's Life. Another one we're not talking about. Mm -hmm. But interesting that this was like its lowest debut, but... As of January 2008, the film grossed in excess of 206 million in North America and 620 million worldwide, making it the third highest grossing Pixar form up to, film up to that point, behind Finding Nemo and The Incredibles. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, didn't do good to start in America, but still ended up making like a ton of money, yeah. ton of money and was great overseas and, you know. One best animated feature once yeah. again. The, the interesting <laughs> thing that I think that this one brings up that we haven't talked this far, you know, a lot of Pixar's work was typified in the early days by working with like Randy Newman yep. for the score. The score of this was actually done by Michael Giacchino. That's right. Who was known for like working a lot with J.J. Abrams mm -hmm. on things like Lost yep. and all that sort of stuff. And he's become a very much, I mean, there are a few composers who Pixar is regular where I worked with Randy yes. Newman's continues to be one, and Michael Giacchino yes. is very much one as well. And dude clearly knows his orchestral be music. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful composer. But it's yeah, I, I think this goes up there with Monsters Inc. in terms of the most underappreciated mm -hmm. Pixar movies. I think a lot of people just forget about yeah. it in general. Uh, I mean, entertainingly enough, when we were researching for this uh, episode, I was like, oh yeah, that is a Pixar movie, huh? Duh. Like even I had forgotten it, and I love it. I yeah, love it's, this movie. it's a great movie. Uh, I, I think, you know, I've long been a Pixar fanboy, no question about that, but it really reached 
boiling point with Pixar and me over the next two films we're going yes. to talk about, and the first one we're going to discuss is Wall-E. Mm -hmm. The story of a trash robot on an abandoned earth yep. who's basically just there by himself cleaning up trash for all eternity for all eternity <laughs> when another robot comes there searching for life essentially mm -hmm. and uh sort of a i guess you would say a friendship relationship whatever you want to call yeah. it develops between the two of them and he's sent on a intergalactic adventure <laughs> trying to basically become friends because yeah. he's alone he's all never the time. experienced another person and all he has is hello dolly to yeah watch all he has over yeah he just again. watches like a movie and he sort of sees the the tenderness of like you know the holding, holding of the hands, hands and yeah. stuff like that and it's just such a beautiful i mean obviously you could argue it's a bit of a ripoff of short circuit in terms of the design of wally it's very much a short circuit type character but only really the binocular eyes that's really what yeah, yeah. but it's still i mean <laughs> such such a sweet character and then you've got obviously the homage to Mac with Eve. Yep. Very much sort of an iMac mm -hmm. sort of design. And Even you the know, boot the, up sound. The, oh, yeah, the homage to silent film with like, I think the first like vocal, uh, the first dialogue that happens in the movie is like 20 something minutes or 30 yeah. something Which minutes. I, I, th I, I will admit, I, I did not think that a silent movie could be done in modern times yeah. until that first 30 minutes Yeah, you're just so watching movie. it and you're just captivated. You're absolutely riveted by what's going on because it's all done so visually, which goes to show that, you know, it's not really surprising the fact that the average number of storyboards on a Pixar film is about 75,000, which is just crazy to think of 75,000 storyboards. That's crazy, yeah. But Wally had 125,000. So, I mean, That's you're amazing. looking at like an, almost an additional 50% of storyboarding, which makes complete sense considering all the silence. I mean, it's amazing. I get, once again, you know, best animated feature. Yep. Uh, you had Andrew Stanton again at the helm, you know, from uh, Finding Nemo. Mm -hmm. So clearly he is also, along with Brad Bird, establishing himself as yes. one of the sort of hit makers mm -hmm. at Pixar. I mean, he'd been there since pretty much the beginning. I mean, I think he worked on like a Bug's Life way I back I think you're in the right, day. yeah. Um, but, you know, you also had Pete Doctor again working mm -hmm. on this with him who... We'll go on to do big things here <laughs> yes, very that soon. we'll talk about. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think it's hard to go against, you know, any of the Toy Stories, because I love all the Toy Stories. Yes. Particularly, you know, 2 and 3 are <laughs> oh. incredible. But, How often does a series get better as it goes on? Yes, <laughs> but I think this is my favorite film that Pixar's done, and arguably my favorite film of the last decade, and certainly one of my favorite films of all time. Wow. Like, I think, I, I just absolutely love the movie. I can, I think, I can completely understand. I think the relationship between Eve and Wally um, is one of the most sweet, non-romantic relationships. Yes. Arguably in the history of I film. Mean, yeah, because that's such a, that's such a to uh, total cliche or trope, depending on how which side of it you're on, of the male and female character obviously have to fall in love. Right. And so having it be a male and female character who it's essentially just a friendship. I mean, but, there's like, some romantic big, element to it, but yeah, it's not... But the big know. thing is holding hands. Yeah, like, the big thing is that they just contact with another if person. If you think about it, like, you know, it goes back to like the Beatles song. Like, I just I want to hold your hand. Yeah. Like, that is it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. like that, uh, that is it. It is just all about connection. Yeah. And like, that's sort of the whole point of like the human element too, is where they're so disconnected mm -hmm. from each other yep. and from the world. Like, they're just going through the motions and it finally is taking to Wally, bringing them back to earth mm -hmm. where they're like whoa whoa what is going on here yep. like and it just goes to show i mean this is the first pixar film to be nominated for six academy awards mm. uh that ties the only other animated film to garner this many no uh, nominations was beauty and the beast so i mean you're talking i mean you're really competing with the old classics if you're competing with beauty and the beast for nominations i think this is the point also that it really started to reach a boiling point of them not being acknowledged for at least even a nomination for best yes. picture like this is the point like this and i think dark knight came out in the same year <laughs> yeah and neither of them were nominated for best picture where people are really just like are you serious like you're not yeah. even going to give us a nomination for best picture yeah like but, how can how can you not do that how can you <laughs> i mean I, I i personally probably would have given it okay let's see what won best picture that year um let me pull it up i it, it's just like I, I can't help but think at least okay, Slumdog Millionaire one. Okay, very good film. Yes, but I still think I could argue that Wall-E is a better film than that. Yeah. Or Curious Case of Benjamin Button, Frost, Nixon, Milk, The Reader, all very good <laughs> yes, films. Yes. But I feel like you had 
equally as big an argument for both the Dark Knight and Wally to I be nominated, agree with that. if not win the Academy Award. It's also neat just that they they went back, they tried to recreate an old look, so they went back and got a bunch of uh, the panoramic cameras that mm. were used to film Star Wars, and they like shot and tried to make recreate the look to be an older look like that. Like they did so much extra work with yeah. this movie to make it look special. And so that brings us to the next year. Again, you know, arguably one of my favorite of Pixar of all oh, time. Probably Pete, my favorite. Where Pete Docter finally got his chance to step mm-hmm. up, and that is up. Ugh. Not a dry eye in the house in the first 20 minutes of this movie. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the <laughs> thing I'll say. I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Um, this, the first 20, or I think it's yeah, like first, 10. Yeah. The first 10 minutes of the film where it's going back through the life of Carl mm-hmm. and his wife. Yes. I, I, I initially watching the trailers didn't get the movie much like Wally. Like yeah. that's one of the things I've said before is Pixar. I don't know if they're great at trailers. Like a lot of times I'm not sure I understand the films from their trailers. Mm-hmm. But this one, like I watched the trailer and I was like, I don't know how they're gonna make that old man likable. Yeah. And the first ten minutes of this film, they turn a guy who you think is probably yeah. unlikable An in the movie curmudgeon. Yeah. and make him like completely sympathetic and the first 10 minutes of this film is arguably the best 10 minutes of film in the history of film like, yeah. I, I think no. you could legit argue that seriously if you just had that as a short it would win and again picture. once again it's I mean, a silent film essentially yeah. it's, it's fucking heartbreaking Ugh. like they express so much there's through the emotions of mm-hmm. the characters that it it's it's Heartbreaking. I've like never seen. Cries, yeah, yeah, I've never seen so many people who never admit to having emotion in movies admit that they full on broke down both and this, felt emotion. Both at the this and this Wally, I, I found myself tearing up. At. Yeah. I think they're both so tender. And yeah, I think both this and Wally, Up and Wally, are arguably my two favorite movies that Pixar mm-hmm. has done. Even though they've done so many great things like yeah. Toy Story, Finding mm-hmm. Nemo, Incredible. And I mean, and just goes to show this is the second animated film ever to be nominated for Best Picture. The first Finally. being, yeah, first being Beauty and the Beast. But that that was sort of the, uh, as I said, you know, the mm-hmm. fallout of Wally not even getting a nomination. Exactly. People are like, "Are you kidding me?" Yeah. Like, and not only was it like, "Are you kidding me?" This doesn't get best picture, but this was also nominated for best picture and best animated feature. Yes, it was which it won. It, just, it won it just best animated feature killed. as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I love the fact that uh, this is also their the first, the very first animated film as well as the first three D film ever to open at Cannes. Interesting. Yeah. And when the film was over, the festival audience remained completely silent. There was no reaction wow. at first. During the panel of the 2011 D23 Expo, executive producer John Lasseter said that it was Tilda Swinton who broke the silence by standing up and uh, starting to applaud. And then wow. the entire audience broke out into applause. That's like, awesome. I think every, no one knew what to do. They were like, that, it's, was, it's so amazing. that was so amazing. Yeah. How do I do what do? What do? <laughs> but you, I mean, you think like, okay, look, you got like... Um, Carl Asner, Jordan yeah. Nag- Nagai, Nagi, uh, yes, the- uh, who plays the kid Russell. I mean, like uh, Bob Peterson mm-hmm. as um, uh, Doug the dog. Yes, oh like, God, it, it's, Doug. I mean, he, he. This is again a classic example of taking people who were te- in some way you know celebrities, but not a list popping people, and putting them putting the right actor in the right role, not trying to find the biggest, most fancy roles or actors to shove into the roles. But it's also, you know, Bob Peterson is one of those guys who dates back to 1994 at Pixar, sort of an animator and stuff. So, you know, it's... It's really very much sort of, yeah, taking the right mm-hmm. person for the right John role. Ratzenberger, being yep. the, who is the only actor who's been in a, a voice in every Pixar film. Mm. And which... Um, was my favorite part of Cars mm. is when they recreated all the other Pixar movies mm-hmm. with little cars at the end. <laughs> He's like, "Wait a minute! There's so many trying to sound the same in all of these." It's the best part of Cars, if you mm-hmm. ask me. Yeah. But you know, yeah. it's it's, su- it's such a beautiful film, and this is arguably the point where I feel like Pixar peaked. Arguably, I mean, Toy Story three is great as well. Yeah. But you could argue one or the other. Um, and but they sort of slowly begin to slide a little mm-hmm. bit downhill since I mean, then. It's as you said, the first ten minutes of this movie are probably some of the best ten minutes in cinematic history. How do you ever top that? Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I mean, Toy Story three is a great film. Don't oh, get me yeah. wrong. And but the it, ending of Toy Story three, the last fantastic. Act is, but that was yeah. the first year that I preferred a DreamWorks picture to it with How to Train Your Dragon. Mm, yeah. I think I think you had uh, Kung Fu Panda going up against Up this year, which I mean I think Kung Fu Panda is really good. But it's no Up. 
It's no up. <laughs> it's no up. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, How to Train Your Dragon was the first time I was like, okay, I actually prefer a non-Pixar movie mm -hmm. to a Pixar. And it's very close. It's yes. very close. But after that, you have, like, Cars 2. Mm -hmm. And Brave was good, but not nearly as good as some of their classic yeah. stuff. And, and it, I mean, it's just, it, it, as you said, like, with trailers and not knowing what the movie's going to be, how, after that first, that setup with this movie... Even if you had known the prognosis of the film, you have no idea where this movie is going to go. Yeah. And it continues to keep you... Uh, the story is so interesting and new, like a lot of their stories are, but so full of heart. Yeah. That you're just... You're so invested, even though you have no idea where it's going to go. I mean, oh, how many people have fall, fell in love with Doug just from that oh, character? Oh, so good. I mean, so you know... <laughs> sweetest... Arguably one of the sweetest characters in the history of Pixar. Yeah, like, yeah. He's just exactly. like all, all <laughs> yeah, sweetness. All love. Yeah. <laughs> Which brings us to uh, this Friday, mm -hmm. it was it June 24th? Yeah. 21st. 21st, June 21st, yes. And we're talking the release of Monsters University. Yes. This is the prequel to Monsters, Inc., the mm -hmm. story of Sully and Mike at college yes. when they go to scare school and sort <laughs> yes. of learn to be monsters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we got to talk about this in terms of the context of doing prequels. Prequels is... Our, is almost always one of the toughest films to make because you know where it ends up. Yes. Like, it really takes a lot of the surprise out of the film yes. when you know what's going to happen after yeah. that. Or, even worse, it it tries to put the original in a different light, which changes the originals yeah. in retrospect, which is Star Wars. <clears throat> yeah. You know, and it doesn't always work, but... This is one of the few instances where... I think it really works because it doesn't try and be anything with the original. Yes. It's its own unique yeah. story about exactly. college. It's more of a college movie than a yes. Monsters, Inc. movie. Yes, and realistically speaking, with the exception of the small mistake, the fact that in Monsters, Inc., they mentioned that they met in elementary school, and this is the, now the meeting in college, with the exception of that small goof, which only probably adults will care about. But you like could, I mean, guy. you could argue it's one of those things that maybe they met there, no, but exactly. they didn't really yeah. befriend each like other. Like I said, at that point, you're nitpicking, and if right. you're nitpicking of our Pixar movie, then you are in the wrong business. I feel like you could also, you know... Or make some sort of convoluted story where it's like, oh yeah, they met there, but they didn't really get to know each exactly. other. Exactly, and for all we something. know, there could be a montage in the beginning of this about how I've they've run into each other. I don't other. recall okay. it. Yeah, no. <laughs> but I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to undercut Pixar. No, no, that's so fine. I, I'm sure. That's like, what I'm saying. It's a. It's a nitpick, and, it, and if you are looking that deep into Pixar movies to try to nitpick something, then that's clearly a testament of the quality of their films. That if that's what you're looking to nitpick yes. is a reason for a prequel, which are generally unnecessary in the first place, then, you know, who cares? <laughs> I, I mean, I, th I think it's better to compare this film to, say, Revenge of the Nerds or mm. Animal House than I, it is to compare okay. to Monsters, Inc. I mean, there's definitely um, good. influence of Monsters, Inc. Like, you know, uh, Mike goes to Mike the scare asking. facility and he sort of gets inspired by I being see. there that he wants to become a scarer, okay. even though he's not necessarily a scary yes. monster. <laughs> yes. And that's sort of what inspires him to go for it in college. Awesome. But like beyond that, like it's really not the core It's not about element. where it leads as much as it's just before in it's, time. It's 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 <laughs> these two polar opposite people. One who's obviously a gifted scare but really doesn't care, care about, about it. Yeah. <laughs> like he's just really all about just size and scare mm -hmm. versus someone who's so passionate about it but is not necessarily a scary creature yes. of himself becoming friends and discovering that together they're a really powerful combination that very as cool. individuals they are. It's it's a very sweet story. Probably one of my favorite Pixar movies since up. I mean, hmm. I, 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 I mean Toy Story 3 again. But <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's one of the best examples of trying to execute a prequel by making it its own unique story, yes. just and having that, yeah, similar that's, characters. That's always the problem with prequels yeah. normally. And so I'm glad. I mean, you know, if anybody's going to do it, Pixar's going to do it. Because it's one of those things where it makes more sense to make a prequel to Monsters, Inc. than to make a sequel. Mm -hmm. Because everything is so different at the end of Monsters, Inc. that to go after that is going to not be the same story. And I mean, I hope, it gets, sequel bait. I hope it gets people to check out Monsters, Inc. again. again? Give, oh, it, give yeah. it a second try. Um, I, I've been always very skeptical about Pixar doing sec sequels. I much prefer them to do original properties. Yep. Obviously, you know, the sequels of Toy Story mm -hmm. and this speak to them being able to continue that quality. Yes. Even still, even with those being good, I still would prefer them to do original properties. Yes. Rather than Cars uh, Bajillion or Planes. Or Pl Planes right? technically not Pixar. That's oh, the, a sorry. Disney. That's a Disney only property. It's, ja it's John Laster <laughs> and his, like, love, I don't want to say 
fascination fascination <laughs> with that universe but like he's really the one driving the cars bus yes. yeah. but um boom hey oh, um, fly in the pla planes plane exactly yeah but um <laughs> this kind of stuff does just showcase that Pixar is one of the exceptions to doing sequel rules. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they can do it and they can do it well. Even still, I would prefer them not to do it. Yes. But Monsters U, fantastic movie, deserves all the accolades it's going to get. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's going to crush it. It's got it. quite a nice uh, yeah. supporting cast, too. A variety of yes. interesting characters. Bringing back all the important people, too. You know, Steve Buscemi mm -hmm. makes a, a return. Uh, you got people like Helen Mirren yeah. in it, Joel Murray, Sean Hayes, Dave Foley, Charlie Day. Mm -hmm. I mean, such great you people. Can't go, you can't go wrong adding Helen Mirren in a movie. I mean, no. <laughs> you really can't. <laughs> and she's got a great... A great part in I assume too. she's a teacher or administrator. She's a, I think she's a principal. Oh, yeah. I forget exactly what her I'm role in the universe. She's some role of authority. I'm not. She, well, she's like she's like the head of the scare school. Okay. But I don't know if she's the principal of the whole university okay. or whatever. Okay. But um, great film. Definitely recommend checking yes. it out. But uh, let us know your thoughts on Pixar and Monsters U at uh, our website, MacGuffin. That's MacGuff.in. Mm -hmm. Or on fancy. Twitter, twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast. Mm -hmm. Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast. Phone number, 323-761. 9842. We're on iTunes. We're on Blip.tv, Miro, Roku. Go get glue, or you can get some stickers. stickers. We're on iTunes and give us some stars. YouTube, give us some thumbs. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. We're in your head. Whoa. Or at least we're trying to be. Yeah. That's just because I've planted earworms in everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we'll see you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to bite the side of style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.